Welcome to Cellular Healing TV. This is episode number 135, and I'm your host, Meredith Dykstra. Of course, we have our resident cellular healing specialist, Dr. Dan Pompa, on the line. And today we welcome special guest, Dr. Mary Wingo, all the way from Ecuador. So we're very excited to have Dr. Mary on the call today. We're going to be talking all about the human stress. So before we jump in, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Mary. So Mary Wingo was born in the United States where she earned a PhD in human stress research from the University of North Texas. In 2014, she emigrated to Ecuador, a tiny living in a new and different society opened her eyes to the unsustainable social, economic, and political costs preventable stress causes in the modern world. Dr. Wingo's aim is to clearly explain to the public the biological mechanisms behind the stress response as well as its staggering costs to society. So, wow, it's going to be an interesting conversation. Welcome, Dr. Mary, to the show. Yeah. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you for being here with this uh, very, very important topic. Uh, you said it right in the bio. In today's world, yeah. I believe there is so many different types of stressors that are accumulating what we call filling people's buckets and then all of a sudden the symptoms start at least in this country then they start medicating them away only to find that that doesn't work anymore they get thrown off the back of the medical treadmill and oftentimes you know they end up coming to you know our show looking for answers so but this is a you know the, the emotional component the stress component is something that we've done a lot of shows on because it is often the hidden component to why people still don't feel well. So you're going to bring some very, very cutting edge science to this today, which I'm really excited even to hear you know, for myself because I, I know this. If we can avoid this stress response in a negative way and keep it positive, we get stronger, not weaker disease. So, so Mary, I have to start by asking this question. How did you get involved in this topic? I mean, this is a very narrow topic. Um, well, number one, I've always been a geek. Um, I've always, and um, when I was a young undergraduate, um, you know, 20, 21 years ago, um, the the topic of like biophysiology or biopsychology or psychophysiology, it's where... Um, the discipline crosses um, from uh, you know like human bio like human like biology to like psychology. This was starting to come into its own um, back about 20 years ago, and, yeah. and you're starting to really they were really starting to understand the dynamics of how the sympathetic nervous mm -hmm. response and how the um, the adrenal response, you know, cortisol um, uh, response was, uh, you know, affected um, various health parameters and all that. And it was, it was still in its infancy. But one thing, it, it was just so fascinating. I mean, compared to um, any other uh, topic in biology or psychology, because um, what we're talking about is how humans adapt. These, it's not just stress. It's, these are the basic core yeah. mechanisms for which all organisms adapt. Okay, so th th this is get getting to something that Darwin uh, would love. Uh, you know, Darwin when he was in the Galapagos, uh, you know, he, he probably wished, you know, he understood um, um, a little bit better. Um, but so, so these are adaptive mechanisms, and there's nothing good or bad about, about them. And what do they represent? What does it represent? It represents, okay, then this is where it gets kind of crazy. It represents two different types of reality that organisms are, you know, have to undergo in order to live uh, in, in an environment. Uh, it represents, we have, includes the nervous response that uh, contends with cyclical aspects in our environment. Okay, so you know, the, the sun's going to rise, the sun's going to set, we're going to usually have our meals at this time. If I'm a woman, you know, I have my monthly cycle, I have my seasons, you know, that kind of, okay. And that composes most of our life. I mean, that, like, as far as percentage of time, that's going to that's gonna be most of our life. Okay, and right. we have... Uh, part of our biology that contends with this. The other part is where the stress response comes in. These are the disruptive elements. These are the novel elements that, okay, you're going along with your day and then, oh, there's a bear chasing you. Mm -hmm. And 
the repetitive cyclical elements cannot process uh, disruptive elements, uh, novel elements. So we evolved, and, and this is a much newer mechanism than the um, uh, other mechanism which contends with the cyclical elements. Um, we have evolved the stress mechanism in order to adapt to the environment. And when I mean adapt, I mean actually um, for the tissues that are stressed become more plastic temporarily oh. so the tissues can reconfigure to the new demands of the environment. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of plasticity. It's right. a matter of plasticity, temporary, temporary right. plasticity, hopefully. Well, I mean, it, it, what, adapt or die. I mean, uh, you know, our bodies have the mechanism, obviously, to adapt. And uh, adaptation, when done properly, you become stronger. I mean, even emotionally, for goodness sake. That's right. You no, know, I mean, physically, everything. You adapt or die, but really, you adapt and become better. And, you know, and, and it's funny, Mary, and I, I want to, you know, keep you going on this topic here, but adaptation is something that I teach my doctors in many different formats meaning that it is always adaptation that really is how we fix oh, it's always. you know we force adaptation through well, no, no, yeah, absolutely. I call it diet variation where we even change the diet even exercise change exercise even something we change that change forces the body to adapt and become stronger go ahead Yes, uh, until um, we abuse and employ those mechanisms to the extent that um, um, we no, and the reason is is that the affected tissue that is um, under extreme abused adaptation becomes excessively plastic, and when that happens, you lose structural integrity. Um, uh, well, Dr. Robinson, this, uh, th this is the root. This is the root of a pathology. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say the the perfect example of that. Uh, there's a slight delay here, so we have to work with because you're in Ecuador. But uh, the, the perfect <laughs> yeah. example of exercise. You know, exercise. We know that you get quickly that <laughs> that plasticity start. You can overtrain, and then you push it too far, and now you don't adapt, and now you become weaker not stronger, and that applies to everything, whether it's physical, chemical, or emotional. Go ahead. Yeah, that is um, exactly, you know, since we understand, we can conceptualize um, how athletes work better. I mean, you know, this is, you know, fairly obvious, you know, uh, how athletes and how athletes, well, the, the stress response for any aspect of our adaptation, whether it's mental or, or physical, uh, runs the exact same uh, uh, trajectory. Um, the, the key is, if you want to be stronger, you, okay, so you have three stages. You have the arm stage where you, you know, realize that there is a, a disruption in the environment. Then you have the resistance stage and then you have the high cortisol which uh, allows uh, the affected uh, uh, stress tissue to, um, to change, do a phase transition and become more plastic until it figures out what exactly the environment is demanding from it. Like for instance, here in the Andes it's altitude. So my like cardiovascular uh, pulmonary function had to reprogram itself and that yeah. is what our stress mechanisms um, that that is what they're they're made to do and so a little bit is great you know you condition yourself uh, and uh, you become stronger but see um, the way that we function in modernized uh, society what we do is we push these mechanisms past um, their expiration date and we enter the exhaustion stage where you get first tissue dysfunction and then you get tissue damage and then you get tissue death and, mm -hmm. and, and this is how all disease every single disease this isn't just stress related basically all diseases manifest in this stage when you've fallen out of homeostasis or equilibrium yeah. and um, uh, you are unable uh, to you know you've got sea legs and you're unable um, to resolve the stressor and and this is this is how I mean it's it's actually quite clear it's actually quite simple um, but th this is a way to really clarify probably the most complex topic in science no joke yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it is exactly 
the way disease. We break homeostasis, and those that don't know what that means, it's simply the body finds balance, and that's perfect health and perfect balance. That's what homeostasis is. Our innate intelligence drives for that always. And as soon as we become out of balance, now we start developing sickness and ultimately tissue death, just uh, like you said. And yeah, and that is exactly the way it happens every time. So, you know, with that said, okay, great. We know that our bodies go through this. If we're not adapting, and if you're out there listening to this and you don't feel well, you're not adapting to something, <laughs> whether it's a chemical stress, a physical, or emotional stress. So, Mary, then what can we do? And I, I don't know if we should take this into a physical, emotional, or a chemical, um, you know, conversation. You know, but it is all the same. So, what should we do? Okay. Well, the, we could go on for you know nine hours <laughs> with this, but I'm going to really try to sum it up. First off, um, what I want people to really take home is that what type of stress that they're exposed to, because a, a lot of folks don't even have the vocabulary. Uh, well, most health professionals don't have the vocabulary either. But the thing is, is that I have determined um, over many, many, many years of analyzing this, there are five major stressors that um, living in a uh, westernized, modernized society, and, and this isn't true of places like Ecuador, Colombia, um, and probably many other um, so-called developing um, countries in the world. So they don't have the level of stress that we do. I, I did not realize the extent of this until I came down here and I experienced this myself. But there are five major causes of stress. First, okay, is probably what a lot of your listeners relate to. That is the um, fatiguing of the working memory mechanisms, the executive function. That's your frontal lobe. That's the part of the brain behind here and behind the eyeballs. And this, um, now, now this is something that might be new to you. This is our primary stress response organ, the frontal lobes. It's not the adrenals. It's not the fight or flight system. For us humans, it's our frontal lobes. Why? Okay, because with our frontal lobes, you know, we are we can uh, rationalize, we can plan ahead, we can follow through on very complex tasks. And our frontal lobes have basically are responsible for how our civilizations, uh, you know, across the world have developed. It's the reason that we're like we are living in buildings and we're not, you know, living like the animals do, um, like in a hole or, you know, under a tree. Um, and why is this? Because, okay, so for instance, say you are freezing. You're, you're cold, you're outside, and you're freezing, okay? Well, an advantage we have over our, our animal friends is that we can actually change the environment to mitigate our stress. Okay, so if you don't have much of a frontal lobe, what does an animal do? Well, the hepatic nervous uh, system activates, you know, due to the cold, and then their thyroid um, hormones secreted, increases metabolism, you get piloerection, that's the goosebumps, you know, all these mechanisms to, if you're the basic animal to try to keep you warm. But no, we, hum we humans have it better. What, what do we have? We've created fire, we've created clothes, all this artificial where us having to bend ourselves to to adapt to the environment, we can at the environment to meet our needs. Okay, so as the frontal lobes are the primary stress response organ, and I contend that um, that is the adaptive advantage. Okay, it's if you look at survival. Um, then you have to look at it through light of stress. I mean, this is how human adaptation works. Any questions so far? So I, I did, when you said number one was the fatigue of the working memory mechanisms, I, I mean, and I, I get everything you said kind of after that, but what, what does that actually mean? Okay. Okay. See, one thing, um, one thing that we really do that's um, self-destructive in modernized society is that we overtax our cognitive resources. Okay. Um, this is something, yeah, so the planning, over planning, over scheduling, multitasking, um, always messing with the gadgets, just always, always, our, our attention's always being disrupted and broken 
and, and just the, you know, we wear it as a badge of honor to just be incessantly busy. Um, and so, although this, this does not seem to affect us maybe in the short run, and, and maybe, you know, we might be really, really good. We might be paid a lot of money to function like in the long period of time. Uh, we end up um, losing a lot more. It's costing us more. We end up, you know, families lose their breadwinners because of the uh, overtaxation of our frontal lobes. Because when we lose our rational thinking and our emotional regulate, then then basically we've lost the back as human beings, and the stress gets worse and we adapt to them, become more and more vulnerable. And this this is the root of where all mental illness springs. Through some sort of stressor of some sort, the frontal lobes become fatigued. Through maybe you know so, actually genetic. So just just yeah. to blame, you're you're kind of breaking up a little bit, but just just to bring it'll it'll probably come back. Just to bring it to our our listeners and our viewers, you know. It, so what you're saying is the modern world. This is number one because. You know, our frontal lobe, you know, the constant texting, the constant, you know, this meeting, that meeting, we're constantly busy, all that stimulation, the, you know, that's what we're saying. That's number one as far as wh where we're really getting stressed and we don't even realize it. We think it's just day to day. Am I right on that? Right. Right. Yeah, this isn't how our ancestors lived and, and this isn't um, the way um, that we function. This isn't the way we adapt over the long term. Let me ask you something, though. Do our kids have an advantage over us? Meaning that, can our, have our kids adapted um, more? Meaning that, can they handle more of the constant texting, the constant stimulation, and everything? And you know, I mean, it's. Are, do they have any advantage over us because they've adapted more? Are they stronger than us, who's fifty? You know, versus them. Well, um, let me uh, let me ask you a rhetorical question. Um, how many children are medicated in our society? How many children have psychiatric problems? Okay. A and so, what, was this common 30 years ago? I mean, just think, compare it to like 20, 30 years ago, and compare it to the children that you see here in Ecuador. Which, I mean, the parents look at like, what medicate my kids? Are you crazy? I mean, they, it's not even a kids don't have ADD down here. They, they don't have it. They don't have it in a way that disrupts society. That, you know, that forces us to medicate them in order um, to function basically in schools. It, 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 this, this was a big surprise for me when I realized this. So no, no. Uh, uh, chances are um, it's going to affect society and this is going to affect um, uh, uh, functioning. I mean, when, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to really see the fallout because if the kids are medicated now, what are they going to be at 45? Oh, you know, what, what, horrible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, medicating right. them for this, it's a shame because, you know, really, it's, you're creating another new stressor, you know, on the body and it, it's just insane. And we could go down that road and I'll pull back because I, I'm very emotional on that topic. So, okay. Number one, let's move to number two. So number one, as okay. simple as you can put it, what, what is the, before we move to number two, number one, as simple as you can put it, in, you know, easy terms for people, that stressor, because we're talking about the five major stressors. What, what is that, sum that up in a something like that? Okay, so to, to sum up number one, the, the overscheduling, overthinking, overplanning, over scheming, multitasking um, is uh, very, very toxic. Is okay. extremely toxic, and um, uh, it, in order to truly effectively manage your stress and not just be a statistic, okay, later on, not be a walking zombie um, who you know dies twenty years early, then you absolutely got to get a handle um, on this yeah. over processing. Okay, so uh, uh, rip one tip then. How do we limit number one? One tip. Okay, well, there's basically a general that I can outline, but for this specific tip, 
you're going to have to advance this additive. And the more you pile up, okay, so it's, it, if you pile up a set and you don't risk it and you pile another one on top of that, you pile another one on top of that, you're introducing the trauma to whatever tissue uh, is being affected. So if, you've, if you have, if, like say you're in a line of work that requires a, a high level of performance, you, you basically have to treat yourself like you would an Olympic athlete. I mean, you've got to um, be immaculate with other areas in your life um, because there's just no way around it. Um, so this is like a credit card with a credit limit and 35% like interest. And so, yeah, it's good for, you know, using it, but if you keep abusing it, um, you'll just, you'll just, Make yourself mentally ill, you, and yeah, so, the ability to work. Yeah, right, I mean, so family what, are winners. What you're saying yeah. is you have to have limits. You have to quit working at a certain time. I worry, Meredith. I worry about Warren right here, right? I mean, Warren is the classic number one, right? And you know, I I have been so worried about his stress level. You know, it's like you know, it's limits. You have to limit it. You have to limit yourself. You have to limit your duties. Okay, let's go to number two because we could get stuck there. Number two. Oh, yeah, that's what I said. We can go on for hours. Number two, number two is um, is living when you are, like, when a person or, or, or an, a male is forced to live in unequal society. So inequality, social inequality oh. is a huge stressor, is a huge stressor. And it's, um, it's you know, it, why, why is this a stressor? Well, those at the bottom end of the totem pole, can't finagle their way. Okay, that cat on the top. You can hire minions to cover a lot of your stressful um, experiences. You know, to make sure everything right. But when you're at the bottom, I mean, your access to resources it, are terrible. I mean, you know, your access to you know safe, inexpensive housing, health care. You've got the worst schedules at work. I mean, you know, swing shifts. You know, all this other stuff. I mean, the worst access to education. And so what what happens is, is that you're constantly having to be on your toes and vigilant. Well, what does this do? This turns your um, your morphology into a permanently more plastic. You're always utilizing these mechanisms to kind of sort of traffic, you know, so to speak. And this is especially true with men. Um, men very much feel uh, the effects of being the bottom on the uh, totem pole. Okay, and, but I, um, in, in what yeah, way? Yeah. Social inequalities. I mean, what comes to my mind is people that are overweight, people that, um, I mean, obviously you said economic status. Um, I mean, maybe the way you look. I mean, am I on the right track here? Well, it's, it's okay, like for instance, the way that, um, Many countries in um, the modernized society has become where the resources pool at the top excessively and the rest of us are left scrambling. Okay? Historically speaking, this is the fodder for revolution. Revolutions occur when you have this phenomenon spread out tens of thousands or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people all experiencing the same desperate levels of stress, you know, just scrambling for resources and, and always having to adjust. Well, this, these are how revolutions and, you know, extreme forms of civil disobedience occur. I, revolutions don't form in a vacuum. They uh, form because um, herds of humans become um, very, and they're basically fighting for their life. Yeah. When, when you're when you're doing it, you're fighting for your life. I mean, when you have nothing else to lose, fighting for your life. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I see that, right? I mean, but you know, here here in the United States, we still have, you know, I, I would say if you live in the United States, you're rich, right? Different in Ecuador, of course, right? I mean, you know, rich people have garages. Uh, you know, it's like. <laughs> Every, you know, I can't say everyone has a garage. Rich people live in homes. I mean, you know, most everyone lives in a home. Not everybody. But, you know, but my point being is different. The United States is to Ecuador. This is greater in Ecuador than here. But do we still experience it? Here? 
Oh, okay, uh, if you don't, don't mind uh, me uh, contradicting you a little bit. No, no, no. Um, I'm good with it. You know, one out of 30, one, one out of 30 children in the U.S. is homeless. We've got, I, I don't know what the statistics is on homelessness, but it's really damn easy to lose your home. And it's really, really damn easy to not have easy access to any type of health care, especially in places like Texas. Um, and, oh, let's see, we don't have uh, most of our cities efficient or any public uh, 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 transportation. And, oh, 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 I have to go deeply in that to get in at university. Now, here in Ecuador, because they have been through the, the seven, uh, circles of hell in their history, I mean, they've been through 75 presidents since 1838. They've had, uh, you know, 20 constitutions. Ten banking days, so they no stress. So, so guess what? Guess what? There's healthcare. There's excellent public transportation. You know, stuff that poor people worry about. And homelessness. Guess what? Is almost nil. I mean, th this is what was shocking me. I'm saying, like, golly, you know, Dallas or or any city, basically any city in the U.S., you're just gonna have, you know, I mean, it's just gonna be a problem. Here in Ecuador, it's almost zero. I mean, it's almost nil. Um, uh, so, thinking like, well, it's a so-called poor country. What? I mean, what's the problem here? I mean, what this does? There's been so many uh, revolutions. Elites know not to siphon off food resource, or else the, the you know. Of course, it's true in most of South America, but here in Ecuador, the Ecuadorians will get out in millions and protest. Basically, you know, um, you know, throw the loud out. Um, and you notice we don't have this in the. It's a lot safer society here. It's safer for women. I've never had a problem traveling by myself. And this is a so-called poor society. It's like you know, per capita income is three or four or five thousand dollars, depending which statistic. How can they afford this? Well, it's basically because it's really not that expensive to provide basic essentials to keep the underclass from you know, getting too stressed I was, I was and causing revolutions. I was looking at some statistics, and you know, here's another stressor, right? More than forty percent of the homeless. Are uh, have disabilities? Isn't and then that isn't that sad, right? Forty percent. So almost half have a disability, you know, which obviously. So according to this, um, according to this, uh, the National Alliance of and you know they look at all the numbers here. Uh, the number is they're saying it's only two percent of files and people in the U.S. are homeless. They're saying. Oh, only two percent. So only six million people. Yeah, five hundred thousand. <laughs> five hundred thousand. Oh, oh. Uh, which is I, I, I don't guess, yeah, they're saying two percent. I, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Uh, like I don't believe a lot of the statistics. I mean, no. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, one out of thirty children is homeless, and what there's around what uh, sixty-five, seventy million children. So you're talking uh, two million. Children alone that uh, have insecure housing situations. So I'm assuming that it's probably a heck of a lot more for the adult population. Yeah, that was total. I think population. it's way yeah. underreported. I googled total population. Yeah. I looked at the same. One was 2.2. One was a little lower, but yeah. So anyway, point yeah. being is that if you're in too that many. status, the stress is greater. Oh, I'm sorry. You cut out. I didn't hear you. Yeah, no. I, just, I said the the point being though is that the stress is greater um, when, especially economic status. And, you know, that's the point. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Life becomes uh, very treacherous uh, when you're especially homeless and you're vulnerable. Um, humans aren't meant to be homeless. You no. know, they're <laughs> we're not meant to be. We're we're meant have a sphere and if you want to avoid civil unrest and frustrated up, upset people then make these simple things very very easy it doesn't take a lot of money it doesn't it, it doesn't have to break the bank 
um, to to you know satisfy um, Haslow's uh, basic hierarchy of needs at the very bottom. I mean, that's all it takes. It's a little bit of security. All of this problems that are right now with uh, you know a, a lot of uh, uppity citizens getting all up in arms they do it quickly um, so what's the, let's go to the third so we can take it time so let's go to the third well, well, well this is yeah we, we could talk about this all day well this is sort of related this is loss of social capital number three is loss of social capital with, um, which has declined precipitously since the Israel Revolution. Um, as Americans, we used to be more like the Ecuadorians, very involved, civic, religious, social. We used to, um, you know, be more connected to our neighbors. Um, you, you know, used to have more cities. Just having a walk of you know, makes you more connected. You're just seeing your neighbors every day. Well, um, you know, I, uh, we have. The structure of our society has disrupted the uh, natural force of a uh, human bonding. And then, you know, add this on top of like, okay, you get your college degree and then you have to move way across the United States or just to get a basic paying job so you can pay your student loans back. So this disrupts communities. Uh, people just don't have economic uh, ability to stay in the place that were born in, moving, 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 changing jobs, and some um, um, social capital um, often replaces financial capital. And as our society um, become more financialized, more developed, okay, and financialized, it has destroyed a lot of the base social capital. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Blanked out there at the end. So, um, is there anything that uh, can be done? I mean, how do we avoid that stress? <laughs> well, well, when you're talking about unequal society and a loss of social capital, um, this is where activism, <laughs> raising good old raising hell. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, this was the attempt of the Occupy movement um, that got um, crushed, um, and I was actually part of the Occupy movement. And I saw this myself, and I've been part of the protest um, movement here in Ecuador. Many, many protests I've been to here in Ecuador. It's a completely different animal. So, um, the, yeah. the, the, the was, you know, we, we, like you said, it was the frontal lobe, and, and you made a comment that it's not even your adrenals yet, right? You know, so the no, frontal no. lobe is the, the, the first thing. You know, now the other ones are a chronic adrenal response, correct? I mean, or is there another response? Because I do want to get into the biological you know, responses you know, as far as, you know, things we can do about it. Um, you know, maybe number four, number oh, five, oh, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we'll talk about that, so I don't want to mess up your flow. Okay, well, I'll just go over real quick, and maybe we can okay. do another show and we can talk about this later um, in greater depth. Well, number four is completely different. This is the depletion or the derangement of the uh, human biome. And the human biome are the little uh, critters that um, have evolved and existed uh, with us for millions of years in our gut, on our skin, and in our orifices. And the reason why um, we, um, we fly into very um, profound response is that these critters are actually functionally part of our physiology. They perform a, a, like they're the extension, for instance, of our digestive response. You know, they uh, synthesize um, certain vitamins, and also they participate in various types of immune signaling, uh, cellular growth signaling, um, endocrine feedback signaling. I mean, there's um, a lot of these uh, covered in very simplified uh, terms in my book. It, it, I mean, literally, like, for instance, if someone took out, you know, your kidney and you just had one kidney, your body would enter a stress response to try to make up for the lost function. And that's what we're seeing. We're losing function or we drain our population of uh, microbes in and on our body. And so we enter a very um, intense stress response uh, from that. And then number five, it is kind of related. This is just chemical stress in general. Uh, um, we need to realize that 
a lot of the chemicals, um, you know, that we are around, you know, whether it's hygiene, whether it's industrial, whether it's uh, cleaning uh, agents around the house, but whatever. Um, a lot of chemicals have been created in the last hundred years, mm -hmm. or less, or fifty years, years, or thirty years. Okay, uh, the faucet, the Roundup. How old is that? You know, thirty, forty years old max. Well, we yeah. have to realize, internalize. We do not have the metabolic um, machinery to efficiently break these substances down. So guess what happens? We're exposed to this. Body sense of disruptions. Senses that direct into a potent stress response, a very intense stress response. And this also includes um, 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 exposure to pollutants of the oil, soil, and water as well. Um, these uh, are responsible for tremendous amount of deaths world. So that basically, that is the five. And so in essence, um, in order to answer your question, for, you, know, uh, you asked 20, 30 minutes ago, uh, in order to um, attenuate and really uh, sufficiently manage, you have to understand these five cats, and then you base a diary. Like, you literally have to list every single one and enlist whatever help, you know, your friends, family, therapist, support group, whatever, in order to list every single stress and what category it falls under. And that is like really the only way. I mean, there's other hacks like piling stresses on top of one another, another type of another hack, understanding that our most potent stress are relational stress, stress between other humans. It's not sitting in traffic, it's stress the the, the arguments you have with your family yeah, in particular. And there's other little hacks, but really it all comes down to making a list, doing an itemized list. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to raise one point. I, I think that's, you know, the, the whole disruption of the human microbiome, um, you know, it's, we talk a lot about the microbiome. Glyphosate obviously disrupting it huge. And like you said, I mean, it wasn't really, you know, last 30 years, right? I mean, at, at best. And, uh, you know, we see that happening in children, you know, and if, 40% of the people homeless are disabled. I mean, you, you, you know, look at the ch children today, right? I mean, all the problems. One in five children with learning disabilities. By the 2032, one in two kids, you know, developing autism if this happened. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, it's like if there's 2.5 homeless children, how sad here in the United States, right? And, and how many of it's because we have these unhealthy poor families out there, you know, it, just, it breaks my heart. The corrupted microbiome, by the way, the microbiome affects this, you know, which ends up affecting your social oh, yeah, absolutely. capitalism. It's just, it's absolutely. so sad. I, this is breaking my heart. Oh, you know, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, can I, can I add a, a little something to that? Um, this is the reason I wrote, wrote this book that, um, has, um, it's obvious, just in our short conversation, we are facing an imminent humanitarian crisis. And don't even get started on the fertility. So, I mean, we're losing population, having kids, you know, and stress directly affects fertility. So, um, unless we really get serious about the public policy and really integrate this into public Help during the imminent Unitarian crisis. Not unlike what happened uh, with the, the um, inhabitants of the Soviet Union during the fall of the Soviet Union, um, yeah, yeah. public health uh, crisis. Right now, and we're in a bad point because, see, you know, and I don't, I don't want to go political here, you know, but it, we have both sides are oh, missing, no. we, you know, the both sides are missing this, right? Meaning that. You know, if you look at where we're over-vaccinating children, you know, we're toxifying them life is safe and vaccinating them, and we're killing them from a physical standpoint. We're creating, you know, these problems, these stressors that you're talking about. I mean, it's like, so... Exactly. It's going to be hard to, to change because of the big money that's uh, controlling a lot of these things that I just mentioned. But... Uh, 
you know, anyways. Okay, so let's let's talk about some cool things, some cool hacks that we can downregulate our stressors. You know, here we are dealing with these stressors. What are some cool things that we can do to help us in these stressful times? Well, um, like, okay, um, like for instance, okay, you need to understand what those five categories of stress are. And in my book, I have attempted to really introduce the vocabulary in not academic terms. Um, this book was heavily edited to uh, take it from the geeky, um, uh, you know, the, the geeky uh, pontificating, you know, lingoese that we scientists and professionals are so bad about and that isolates and, um, um, you know, a lot of Joe Ash, you know, they're actually very smart people, but they just don't have our vocabulary. And now that, you know, the Joe Ash person has the vocabulary, just sit down and make a list. And then just like you would a diet or just like you would if you're, like, uh, controlling your spending, like with a hatchet or with a surgeon's knife, just start cutting, 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 cutting. There's no other way. I mean, there really not any other way around this. Um, like I said, you can keep in mind that stress is additive and that if you're under a lot of stress, you need to treat it yourself. You are a, a, um, a Russian racehorse or a Ferrari or a, a athlete in training. Okay, you have to realize the exposure since relational stress is the most toxic stress. The um, exposure to toxic um, relational stress, you know, toxic relationships, um, you know, and of course, really like um, control the chemicals. Uh, that, I mean, and I'm talking stuff maybe even as simple as soap. I mean, really, really, because we just lather, slather our stuff ourselves and expose ourselves. Um, to these household, just household, and um, uh, uh, work uh, and uh, occupational locals. And you just have to go through each one of these. If you don't have a social support system, well, understand that uh, you may you know, uh, not live to be a very old age. So this True. makes a good you know, uh, excuse to become more social. Um, it, you got to the most complex topic in science, period. Um, um, but, and, and ultimately, you know, we, we like to tell people to do mindfulness, medit which is very, very important. And in essence, this making a list is just sort of a more clinical, structurized form of mindfulness meditation, being mindful. What you're doing is you're engaging your frontal lobe to not dissociate and to just pay attention to the actual reality in your life. And then when you can do that, you can use your frontal lobe to change things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how, I was just going to say, you know, what about the center, the midbrain, where we, you know, really, how we think about our stressors, right? Meaning that, you know, I have gotten better at looking at things that happen and go, I can choose how to react to them, and I'm not going to choose to react to it, you know, in an alarming way, you know what I'm saying? So that's a different part of our brain, right? We have our amygdala that stores these reactions when certain things happen and we have this response, but we start to go, oh, wait a minute, I have to, I can choose not to react that way, and, you know, I've gotten so much better at that, and now when things happen, um, it's, I go, you know what, it's, you know, it's going to work itself out. I mean, I, I give things to God every day like that. I mean, where, how does that fit? Well, I'll, I'll kind of share with you something that's kind of cute about the uh, Latin American culture. Um, it's uh, the manana, the manana uh, attitude, like, I'll get it done tomorrow, which is manana. Uh, that uh, translates to tomorrow is uh, manana in Spanish. And um, that means, you know, to get anything done. And things are, you know, are very, very efficient, actually, and things do get done. Uh, but yeah, it's a certain attitude. But, but specifically, specifically for those people um, that in, in our society that are really afflicted with profound anxiety and mental illness, okay, it all comes down to one regulating the nexus where your thoughts 
and your flight, okay, the, the heart pounding, um, the panic part, the nexus is in hypothalamus, posterior hypothalamus, and specifically paraventricular nucleus, and it's, this is just conditioned responses, so it's not, not permanent. But ultimately what it comes down to is increasing levels of oxytocin, because oxytocin wow. dampens um, runaway uh, um, sympathetic so The problems with mental illness don't really come with the mental part. It comes with the horrific sensation, you know, those feelings of panic and you know insecurity and, and all that that come being mentally ill. Fear, you know, that kind of thing. You know, the really uncomfortable physical states, the tight stomach, the tight throat, horrible. Well, that can be mitigated oxytocin yeah. and that's not necessarily it doesn't really necessarily like you can't just give someone like a for oxytocin you know or they can it through their nose I mean there's a little bit of effect but ultimately is that feeling of safety okay and, and we've most regard in our cultures in our Machiavellian doggy dog world our sense the importance of the basic human sense of safety, okay? Mm -hmm. And so when you're safe, that is when your oxytocin is, is functioning, secreting at a prop level enough to dampen the sympathetic nervous response. And so you're free to think your thoughts with the physiological uh, somatic reaction. Yeah, so um, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Dr. Mary. Um, you know, then our oxytocin is considered the love hormone, right? And we know that hugging, touching, kissing, and I, I think that it goes with what you said. If you don't have a social network, you know, ultimately that's going to lower your oxytocin. I mean, just being around people that you love. Animals, my dog, I'm telling you, my dogs really, in, in, you know, escalate in oxytocin, man. I love these dogs. But anyway, so, I mean, so just telling our viewers uh, on what oxytocin is, so are there other ways besides that to raise oxytocin, or is that it? Whatever it takes to establish the feeling of safety, whatever it takes, whatever right. it takes. Yeah. Okay, because we, we don't have our moms there, and our moms weren't available to... Uh, program our oxytocin, um, uh, the physiology, uh, physiological pattern of uh, oxytocin release. I mean, it's originally from our moms. A lot of times, our mommies weren't able to do that. Okay, so whatever it takes to feel safe. I mean, at any yeah, at I mean, any level. Okay. And by the so way, remember this is this is how. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. By the way, it feeds back into the the social thing, right? Think about it. Well, in um, in these areas, how many do you have fathers? How many have mothers on drugs? How many? You know, what I'm saying, we're, the no oxytocin, zero. You know, from the time they're kids, even when that their brain is forming before age seven, zero, and then that affects them later in life. I mean, we all feed one another. Oh gosh, well, are you familiar with Alan Fratelli's work? The uh, adverse childhood experiences study. It's a huge, long, uh, longitudinal study. It's oh, been going on several decades, maybe even three. It's a long time. And basically, um, childhood trauma. Okay, um, you know, they ask you ten questions and stuff like, were your parents divorced? Were one of them incarcerated? Were your parents uh, their domestic violence? Was your your parents or more of your parents mentally ill? You know, that those kind of questions. 10. And what he has found, I mean, like a stair step, almost one to one correlation. If you're getting into the realm where you're answering yes to six of those 10 questions, then you're looking at a 20 years uh, shaved off your lifespan because well, you're, you're seeing an explosion of stress related diseases, bad, mm. an all shave approximately 20 years off your, your life. So, absolutely. Um, uh, this has got long-lasting uh, effects um, that affect a person throughout the system, definitely. Yeah. But it's not just social. Okay? Like for us, you know, um, I, I 
I left the U.S. because I found it personally to be too stressful for me. I'm a very, very sensitive person, mm. and I just, I just, I mean, I, I cured a number of chronic diseases just living here. So living in a more equal society, uh, not taxing the, those frontal lobes, you know, being a bit more human friendly to yourself instead of the like push it, push it, push it, push it, push it. Um, you know, course uh, down and uh, limiting your exposure to uh, other types of uh, uh, chemical stressors. So it's not just social and that feeling of safety comes from when you actually regard yourself as a human being and you do whatever it takes to feel safe. I mean yeah. whatever it's, it's part of it social, part of it psychological, part of it is just uh, self-care of the physical body. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, you know, the clients that I see are, you know, they're so chemically stressed that it affects their adaptation to their emotional stuff to the point where they can't even deal with loud noise, you know, let alone excitement, even the positive. You know, when I was sick, Mary, I couldn't even watch a football game or something fun because it would get any excitement at all. I would just go into anxiety because I just. I couldn't even handle the lot of noise. Uh, you know, that's how messed up my adaptation process from the pituitary hypothalamus to my adrenal axis was just destroyed. And um, so many people today. So you're right. When you put this all together in the United States, the chemical, the obviously all these pressors that you're talking about, go, 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 that we're, we're all under, right, and the technology boom. It's like, oh my gosh! I mean, I, you know, we need some biohacks like the oxytocin, oxytocin, right? I mean, we better start elevating our oxytocin. <laughs> you know, uh, suggestions. Yeah. You've given us great ones, but we're just in the sake of time. We probably only have time for one more. And then Meredith, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Like, for instance, um. I, I mean, all I can do is show you what I've learned, like say from the Aquarians and from other um, uh, cultures uh, here in South um, The favorite word of Ecuadorians, when someone's getting kind of a little bit torqued up, a little bit, I mean even, I mean nothing that what, even what we consider in our culture, but just a little bit sort of out of balance, they'll go, tranquilo, tranquilo, that means, okay, calm, be tranquil. You know, so um, there's this sort of unspoken agreement um, that people don't have, you don't have road rage, even though the traffic is absolutely ghastly uh, and dangerous down here. Um, you don't have road rage. Um, you don't have people um, yelling at each other um, like we do. We get, and you um, don't have the violent program. Um, they import all the, um, like, like say, Tarantino type flicks. They import from our society. They get their adrenaline fix from watching our media. They don't, I mean, well, why, the men they all love, they, they, they get their adrenaline fix from importing media from our culture. Ah. Okay? They get their adrenaline fix. Because they, they like, like, for instance, the men all love uh, Lionel Richie and Kenny Rogers. Okay, what what do men love in our society? You know, Henry Rollins and Beastie Boys, and you know, really aggressive. No, no, the the, the men love the music. For instance, that usually it's you, woman's music or easy listening music, and it's really quite funny. Um, yeah, I, every step of the way, they're you know trying to calm each other down. Or just be polite and welcoming. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know, uh, greet each other when you walk into a store. Buenos dias. Well, if you don't do that, you're very poorly mannered. It's a very polite society. And let me tell you, um, they've got to really control us. They're just not as sick as we are. You, you go into the clinics, the socialist clinics, so they don't pay anything. And they're almost always empty. It's like the doctor can see you like right now. He's waiting around like nothing to do. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, you know, it's it, funny, Mary. You is believe it. it. I would argue. I would argue, though, that if their society started earning more money, their stress level is going to go up. 
I mean, honestly, because here's the thing. They'll import, they'll create more technology. They'll have more technology. They'll, they'll, they'll start vaccinating more. They'll start taking more drugs. They'll start, I mean, it's like it's this catch yeah. right? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, and and you do see because um, uh, um, Ecuador in the last, oh, it's only been 15 years, they've come out of basically the Stone Age where, I mean, they didn't have internet, I mean, they didn't have basic infrastructure yeah. to, um, to, like, everything, a lot of infrastructure is, like, totally cutting edge, new, and you do, you've got this, uh, you know, you've got, 30% of the people have got bachelor's degrees. You've got a professional class. And sure enough, that materialistic, you know, doctors, lawyers, accountants, you know, that class, professors, they're just, well, they're not quite as bad as we are in the States, but that have the mental illness and the stress-related diseases really start to crop up in a more materialistic I, I, class. I, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I see that, right? But here's the deal. We're not going to stop humankind from driving that, right? Especially here in the U.S., right? I mean, it's it's there, right? Okay, so you know that's why I keep going back to okay, what can what can we do, right? What can we do to make sure we mitigate the stress, and what can we do? And you've answered some of that, you know, but you know, what people watching this are going to be like, yeah, great, but I'm not giving up this. I'm not giving up this. I'm not giving up this. I'm not, so what do I do? So. Well, you know, smoking was considered very fashionable and even healthy, right? And uh, that was a very deep part of our culture, you know, was you know, the media, you know, the old Bents and the Hedges um, magazine, um, you know, uh, advertisements, you know, made it very, you know, this is what the cool people did. But yet, um, we were able to change um, a pattern to it's epidemic. Um, that's when condoms When it comes down to it, you follow the advice of probably the greatest American philosopher, and that's Henry David Thoreau. He is the guy that coined a simplicity. You know, he was the guy who was like the first simplicity movement. And, and what did he say? He said, hey, throw the baby. Okay, the best parts of technology, but don't adopt the total, you know, the, the total package. Really, look at which parts really benefit you the best, and then just give the rest up. I mean, there's really no other option. I mean, this is what I've done. This is what I've done. I take on the best parts of technology, and then. The stuff that um, causes stress, I have totally like eliminated from my life. You know, stress yeah. uh, relationships. Yeah. I don't have a TV. I mean, I mean, there's there's a lot of things people can do that make a huge difference when you repeat this over a decade, two decades. That kind of um, um, that kind of effort. I've learned that I, I agree. I mean, at some level, everybody has to make some decisions and say, okay, I, I've got to give this up. I've got to give up TV at night. I've got to give up. The, you know, I mean, it's true. I, I mean, and, and you are going to take massive stress out of your life. You know, I I do very really well. I've learned to break up my day. You know, when I do certain workouts, when I do this, when I do that. And, uh, you know, that pulls me away from the things that, that, you know, that constantly are stressing me. And, you know, I... It, you know, anyways, that's great. And, and we'll let, end on that, but then let me turn it back to you. And Mary, I want to thank you, you know, for coming on. Thank you. This is very stimulating conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mary. Thank you, Dr. Pompa. Really interesting conversation and a really important dialogue that we need to have and continue to have as well as social media and, and a lot of these other technologies start to creep more and more into all of our lives. So yeah. we'll have to continue the discussion. And thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone, for watching Cell TV. And have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Oh, 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 okay. okay oh, one, one, one more thing, Mary. I, I, I need Ah. Uh. I need I need to plug my website. I need to plug my yes. website and my book. Thank you. Tell us how people find out more about you. Okay. Yeah, they can go to marywingo.com and they can
can pick up a copy of my book for very, very inexpensive. This, I want this information to be available to people of all uh, socioeconomic classes. I realize a lot of people are struggling, but they need this information. Any uh, uh, assistance with workshops or coaching or, like, say, business consulting because work um, stress is probably one of the biggest uh, sunk costs, especially right now, that a business has, they can get a hold of me. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. You almost forgot that, Meredith. I'm I know. I know. And I usually <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry. That was totally my fault. So we'll, we'll definitely put your information. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, in it's a great conversation. Yes, yes, it was, and really important one to have. So thank, thank you, you so much for joining the show, and um, everybody take care, and thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, bye.